4th of July, 1776, the day we celebrated our independence from Great Britain. However, not only was it our independence that we celebrated, but the birth of our great nation. A nation that was forged on the sacrifice of pilgrims, pioneers, and patriots. One of men and women who believed in and trusted in God. People who knew his creation and all it had to offer. Selfless men who believed in something much bigger than themselves. I have a dream today. Our founding fathers, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, they were simple men, but yet men of principle. These men knew that America had a great purpose. Such men stood to tyranny and declared that a nation should only belong to one creator, a creator who gave us a land where the mountains soar high, where the rivers run deep, and where our children can be free. Our American Revolution took heart and prayer. It took determination and courage. There have been and continue to be countless brave men and women devoted to our country who left the comfort of their homes and loved ones to sacrifice their lives in order to secure our rights and our freedom. We live in a nation that has emerged and grown strong, substantially through the vision and efforts of inventors, idealists, and innovators. The inventive potential and power America has gained and displayed has made us who we are known to be today, the land of opportunity. A people that pursues happiness, a better life, freedom, and a brighter future. We took our dreams and made them a reality. We turned what was thought to be impossible and made it possible in what was one small step for man. It was a great step for mankind. Today, as we celebrate our nation's independence, the sacrifice of our forefathers, a nation that was created for a purpose, as we proudly wave our red, white, and blue and celebrate our freedom, a freedom born of sacrifice, blood, and sweat, as we rejoice to be a part of a nation of mountains and valleys, as we come together in our America, we salute those who gave their lives. We salute those who believe in freedom and we remember that we are one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. Today we celebrate the birth of our nation. Happy 4th of July from our nation's capital. You know, today we have a lot to thank God for, for the freedom we enjoy every day and the brave men and women who fought to defend it, for our diversity, every nation, every race, and every color are represented in our great country, and it makes us stronger, and for the way America cares about others. You know, when there's a need around the world, Americans are the first to respond with humanitarian aid and financial support. I love our country, land of the free, home of the brave. And as an American, I personally believe America is truly the greatest nation on the planet because at its very core, our freedom is rooted in the truth of God's word. You know, I spend a lot of time outside of our country and it always makes me more grateful for the place that I call home. Is she perfect? Of course not. But America is a blessed nation and it has been from its foundation because of those principles from God's word They've served as guideposts to our founding fathers as they set out to build one nation under God. But in recent years, our United States have not been so united. In fact, some have called us the not so United States of America. The current season that we're in has been marked by division and conflict. Last year's election process seemed to create an even greater divide in our country. The verbal attacks weren't just political party against political party, it tore into friendships and even positioned family against family. And many of us thought we would see it resolve after the election only to see it escalate again with marches and riots across major cities. Washington was filled with demonstrators and protesters needing for their voices to be heard. Today, I'm not gonna address the political or moral reasons that have led to the conflict and division that we're experiencing today, but rather I wanna address how we, as the church, should respond to the conflict? What is our responsibility as the body of Christ to our nation? How can we help heal the divide? And even more specifically, how does Jesus want to use you as a Christ follower to help heal our land? As I've been traveling around our capital this week, I'm seeing police and barricades set up to control the crowds, all in an effort to keep the peace. You know, believe it or not, it hasn't always been like this. 
There used to be a day when you could come to Washington, D.C. and not see much of any military presence. It would be odd, out of the norm. Well, today it's the new norm, and it's necessary. Now more than ever, our military service is here to keep the peace. See, the same men and women trained to fight the battle are also there to protect the peace. The same training and focus used in the battle are necessary to keep the battle at bay. Peacekeeping takes courage. You know, as I've been praying about this weekend, asking God what he wanted to speak over our church, I realized there were, there were many things I could talk about, many truths about the founding of our nation as one nation under God. I could talk about all the proof there is of our founding father's desire to build a nation that would be governed by the principles from God's word. In fact, it was Patrick Henry, the man that was noted for shouting, give me liberty or give me death, that also said this, and I quote, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's powerful. Or I could talk about how Thomas Jefferson, the man who is supposedly responsible for wanting separation of church and state, was the same man who as president required that the Bible be taught in all grades of all classrooms here in Washington, DC. How's that for separation of church and state? But as I prayed about this weekend, there was one verse that the Lord kept bringing back to my heart and mind. And I believe it is the word for this hour for our church. This hour when we find our nation so divided. It's found in Matthew chapter five, verse nine, where Jesus very simply says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Notice that Jesus doesn't say there, blessed are the peace lovers. There's a lot of people who love peace. He doesn't say, blessed are the peaceable or the easy to get along with people. Instead, he says, blessed are the peacemakers, those who actively work to resolve conflict, who work for peace. See, I believe in a season that has been defined by criticism and such deep division in our country, we as the church, we have the responsibility and the opportunity to model unity, to be peacemakers. And the Bible says that where there is unity, where there is peace between brothers and sisters, there the Lord commands his blessing. You can actually usher in the blessings of God over our nation by actively pursuing peace. So I wanna give you a few insights from Jesus's words in chapter five of Matthew that will help you fulfill your role as a peacemaker so that you and the people around you and our nation can walk in God's blessings. The truth that we're gonna look at today applies to our nation, but it also applies to you. If you apply these truths to your life and to your relationships, you're gonna experience God's peace in ways that you never imagined. The first truth is this, peacemakers reflect the heart of their father. Peacemakers are gonna reflect the heart of their heavenly father. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the children of God. Notice that he doesn't tell us in that verse how to become the children of God. He simply tells us that the children of God are in fact peacemakers. They reflect the character and the heart of their father. As many of you know, Julie and I have one son, Jefferson. He's 21 years old, attending Southeastern University at Christ Fellowship. And man, do I love that kid. He's the apple of my eye. He's like the joy of my heart. And boy, is he just like me. His mannerisms are like mine. His facial expressions are like mine. He's got my eyebrows. Hearing him talking to people around the church, I think that sounds just like me. Well, he's picked up on my traits because he's been around me his whole life. Here's the point. Sons that stick around their fathers have the characteristics of their father. And the Bible clearly tells us that our father is a God of peace. He reconciled the whole world to himself through the blood of Jesus Christ, it says in Colossians chapter one. He is a peacemaking God. I mean, the whole story of redemption, the whole message of the Bible is God's strategy to bring about lasting peace between man and God. And God speaks a lot about the peace he wants between man and man. God wants us to get along. If you have more than one child, you know exactly what I mean. You just want your kids to get along. You'll bribe them if you have to, just so that they would stop fighting. But kids are gonna be kids. They're gonna argue and they're gonna fuss and fight from time to time, especially when they're young and immature. In fact, the more immature they are, the more they tend to fight. But hopefully as they mature, they put that behind them. 
And the same is true for us. As you spiritually mature, you're gonna grow to be more like your heavenly father. And since God is a peace-loving, peacemaking God, we as his children should be peacemaking as well. What he loves, we love. What he pursues, we pursue. And God pursues peace. Peacemakers reflect the heart of their father. I'm here in front of the Lincoln Memorial. You know, no president could be more appropriately be called a peacemaker than Abraham Lincoln. As divided as our country may seem today, Abraham Lincoln led our nation through its darkest point in history, the South succeeding from our country over the evils of slavery, brother fighting brother. And in the middle of it all, this president stood up for the dignity of humanity and kept our country from imploding from within. President Lincoln is quoted as saying, peace is a thing which a person must be willing to fight for. Now that sentence might sound like a contradiction at first because fighting seems so aggressive, so destructive. But Lincoln was saying it's gonna be a fight. It's gonna be a struggle. You're gonna to have to work harder to get the peace than you thought, but peace is worth it. And Lincoln was a man willing to fight for it. Though it cost him his life in the end, he established a peace in our nation. Imagine what America would be like today if he had not fought that fierce battle for peace. You know what I love about Lincoln is he took the responsibility himself. He took the initiative. And that's the second truth that we pull from this passage in Matthew. Peacemakers take the initiative. Remember we talked about the difference between peace loving and peacemaking. One is passive, the other is active. And if you're gonna be a peacemaker, you have to take the initiative. See, after Jesus states, blessed are the peacemakers for they are the children of God, he begins to tell us what it means to be a peacemaker. A few verses down in verse 23, Jesus says, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and they remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar First go and be reconciled to them and then come back and offer your gift. So peace between you and me is so important to God that he says, don't waste your time coming to worship and praising God when there's conflict between you and a brother or sister. Go get that resolved. And he says, you go, you take the initiative and make peace. Don't wait on someone else to make the first move. You do it. Some of you need to plan your own peace conference because you know there's someone that you're having a conflict with and God is telling you today, take the initiative, go and be a peacemaker. And notice in that verse, the emphasis was on reconciliation, not resolution. It said, go and be reconciled. There's a difference. To reconcile means to reestablish the relationship. What it doesn't mean is that you're necessarily gonna resolve all the problems. Because the truth is, we're always gonna have legitimate differences between us. Why? Because we're all different. We grow up differently, we have different perspectives, different family values or traditions in the way we might have been raised. We're not all gonna see eye to eye. We're not all gonna agree over every social or political issue. We can learn to disagree agreeably. We can walk arm in arm without having to see eye to eye. We can have reconciliation without always having full resolution. See, sometimes when there's conflict in relationship, we want the other person to admit that they were wrong and we were right. You know, they voted for the wrong person, we voted for the right person. Their perspective on one issue is wrong and our perspective is right. And listen, if you take that position, you're never gonna experience peace. Reconciliation focuses on the relationship while resolution focuses on the issues. Let's be a people focused on the relationship. So while we may not agree on every issue, we can still remember that we are on the same team. Because here's what I know, what unites us is far greater than what divides us. Let me say that again. What unites us is far greater than what might divide us. When you see conflict in your relationships, and see it as an opportunity to work for unity, to ask questions, to listen to the other person, and to let them know that you value them as a brother or a sister. Listen, I guarantee if you take the time to listen, you will grow in your understanding and you'll make room for peace to take root in the relationship. Last year, we as a nation faced division like we hadn't experienced in years. With the shootings in Ferguson, Baton Rouge, Dallas, Texas, and even in Palm Beach County, racial tensions were heightened. It was a topic of daily conversation on the news and in the workplace. And if you recall, we stopped everything we were planning as a church to address this crisis head on from a biblical perspective. How can we as a church come together and not allow our enemy to divide us, but instead be used by God to bring healing to our communities, to be used by God to bring unity. 
At that time, I, I challenge you to get with somebody that is looking at this issue through a different lens, coming at it from a different perspective, to ask questions about why they see it the way they do and then listen. You know, that sparked hundreds, maybe even thousands of conversations between brothers and sisters. And instead of allowing that crisis to bring division within the church, it strengthened our relationships. We listened, we learned, but it took work. You know, this is the place where hundreds of thousands of people gathered to hear Martin Luther King Jr. give his famous, I have a dream speech. Martin Luther King was a man who worked for peace. With every bone in his body, he fought for peace. He was a peacemaker. Yes, he led marches and protests around our country, but he was always resolved to do it peacefully. Martin Luther King actually wrote a sermon once on this passage of scripture that we're reading from in Matthew chapter five. And this is what he said. Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. We never get rid of an enemy by meeting hate with hate. We get rid of an enemy by getting rid of enmity. By its very nature, hate destroys and tears down. By its very nature, love creates and builds up. Love transforms with redemptive power. See, Martin Luther King understood that God's love is the secret to bringing healing and peace into every relationship. In this passage, Jesus goes on to say in Matthew, you've heard that it has been said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now, I have to be honest, when I hear the words of Jesus, I think, really, Jesus? I gotta pray for my enemies? I have to bless them? I mean, when somebody offends me or hurts someone I love, I have to pray for them? I mean, I'll pray for them, all right. I'm gonna pray that God convicts them. Pray that they see just how much they've hurt me and how wrong they are. I don't think that's what Jesus means in that passage. Jesus says, bless them. That means I speak their name and I pray that God would send his blessing and his favor over their lives, over their family, over their business. And that brings us to our third and final insight. Peacemakers pray. Peacemakers pray. The best defense is a great offense. Let me say that again. The best defense is a great offense and prayer is a great offense. When you pray for your enemies, when you pray for those that you don't see eye to eye with, God begins to soften your heart for them. There'll be arguments that, that won't ever be had, fights that won't ever take place because peacemakers pray. And when it comes to our country and the peace that we want in our nation, it starts with praying for our leaders, whether we voted for them or not, whether we like the decisions they're making or not. In fact, you might feel like they're making all the wrong decisions. Listen, you don't need to talk to your coworker about it. You need to talk to God about it because your coworker can't do anything about it, but God can. You can pray for our president and for our Congress and Senate to be led by the Holy Spirit, that God would put godly men and women around them as counsel, that he would direct their thoughts and their decisions. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 2.1, he says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and to all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And he goes on to say, this is good and pleases God our Savior. Think about it. It pleases Jesus when you pray for your leaders. Let me ask you, when was the last time that you prayed for those in authority? For President Trump or for Governor Scott or for other senators or congressmen? Because it says there, pray with intercession. That means you're really praying for them, not just some obligatory prayer, God bless our leaders, God bless our president. It says with thanksgiving for what, who they are and where God has placed them. You know, I noticed in that verse that it said, pray for your kings and those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. The apostle Paul tells us why we are praying for them. It's so that we may live in peace in our land, that we may live in all godliness and all holiness. We're not just praying for them, we're praying that God will work through them so that we as a people can live in godliness, which means in right relationship with God and in reverence for God, and that we could truly have one nation that is under God, one nation under his lordship and under his direction. Proverbs 21.1 says, the Lord can control a king's mind as he controls a river. He can direct it as he pleases. And in the same way God can make a river go to the left or to the right, it says there that the Lord can control the king's mind and his decisions. 
God controls the minds and decisions of our leaders. That's our prayer. So if you don't like what's happening up here in Washington, pray because peacemakers pray. And through prayer, we as Christians can make a difference in the course of our nation because God can do more in seconds than men can do in centuries. Peacemakers pray. I think the best peace talk that we can ever have is on our knees with God. Peacemakers pray. Second Chronicles 7:14 says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. You know, this verse speaks of an earnest pursuit of God because we know that a political party is not our answer for this country's need. Our hope isn't in our president or any other politician up here in Washington. Our hope is in the maker of heaven and earth. So church, let me tell you why this message is so important for us today. Why you and I have got to learn how to be peacemakers. Because peacemakers are unity makers. Peacemakers create the atmosphere for unity to take place. Psalm 133 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity, for there the Lord commands a blessing, life forevermore. It's the only place in scripture where God actually commands his blessing, where there's unity. See, unity creates a place for God to show up. Remember in the upper room in Acts chapter two, when the believers came into one accord, when they actually came into unity, it said it ushered in the Holy Spirit and the city of Jerusalem and the world was never the same again. See, our unity is critical to our mission. Let me remind you that our unity does not mean uniformity. Unity will not mean that we agree on all political or social issues, but it does mean that we unite around the most central issues of our faith. I believe that in this season that is being defined by deep division and criticism in our country, we as the church must look different. Our words and our actions must unite and not tear down. Our words must heal and not divide. I believe God will use his church. He's gonna use you to be a peacemaker, bringing unity, creating a place for God to heal our nation once again. So let me leave you with this challenge on this July 4th weekend. First, take personal responsibility for peace in your relationships and in our nation. And if there's someone that you need to go talk to this week to begin a peace conference with, to heal a hurt, you make the call, you go to them and let God use you to bring healing. And second, pray because peacemakers pray. Pray for our country, pray for our leaders, pray that they will lead us into all godliness and holiness and that we will see God exalted over America once again. God bless you, I love you. And may God bless our United States of America. Amen, church. Well, we've created time in our service today to put into action what we just heard, to pray. And so I've asked a few of our volunteers and team here to just lead us in a time of prayers as we take personal responsibility for being peacemakers. So right there at your seat, if you just bow your heads and close your eyes as we're led, in a time of prayer together, Josh. Father God, we just humble ourselves before you, Father. I humble myself before you, Father, as we just get to come as a community to gather together, Father God, to put your name first, the name of Jesus, Lord, the name that is above all names, the most powerful name that's spoken, Father. I just ask that you just take this sense of unity, Father, and you just make it rich in my life, Father God. You just make it rich in everybody's lives here, Father. This division that's taken place in our country, Lord, we know that you are stronger than all. You are more mighty than all, Father God. So I just ask that you just rain your Holy Spirit down on our leaders, Father God that you just move through our president, Father, that President Trump just feels the presence of God as he walks in the meetings, as he meets with people, Father God, as our Congress gathers together to make decisions that have ramifications from the top all the way down to the bottom, Father, that you would just speak your presence through them, Lord, that the name of Jesus would be put above all, Father, that peace 
would come over this nation, Father God. And the only thing that's going to allow peace to come over this nation is you, Father God. So I just pray that you just open the hearts of all, Father God, that you just bring us together, that you unite us, Lord, that this this sense of unity, Father, would just be put in all of our hearts as we walk out these doors, Father God, and as we get into our lives and we lead the people that are around us, the spheres that we are in, Father God, that peace would just speak through us, Father God, that your name would be above all names, Father. So we just thank you for this, Lord. I ask you for this in Jesus' mighty, 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 mighty name. Gracious God, we come to you tonight as humbly as we know how. You've told us, Heavenly Father, that uh, peacemakers reflect the heart of God. So we come to you tonight, Lord, praying for healing for our land. We're praying, Lord, for healing for our country and here locally as well, Lord. Lord, you said in your word that blessed are those uh, whose hearts are brought close to you and that we are asking you, Lord, to bring us closer to you and to keep us focused on where we need to be. You've also told us, Lord, in your word that those peacemakers that sow peace will also reap a harvest of righteousness. So we're claiming that right now, Lord. We're declaring it, Lord. We're saying thank you for what you've done and for what you're about to do. And I here today, Lord, take personal responsibility for peace And I reach out to my brothers and sisters, and I encourage them to reach out for peace as well. Amen. Father God, we just thank you for your word, and we just don't think it's any accident that in your word that it says to humble ourselves first and then to pray. God, I just pray that you would help us to humble ourselves. God, I pray that you would help us to love people not the way that we want to be loved or the way that we think they should be loved, but God, that we would see with your eyes the way people that need the way people need to be loved. God, I pray, God, that you would give us your eyes to see people the way that you see them. I pray, God, that you would give us your ears, that, that we would hear their hearts and not their hurtful words. I pray, God, that you would would help us to be your hands and your feet. I pray, God, that you would help us to no longer expect peace to come from the top down. But God, that you would ignite in our hearts a revolution of peace, God. That you ignite in our hearts a revolution of peace at this level, God. That each of us would take responsibility, God. That that we would be the church. That we would no longer expect people to act like they're believers when, when they don't have the light within them, God. But we would step up that we would be the the catalyst for peace in our nation. But God, not only in our nation, but in our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces, God, in our community. God, that it would be a grassroots revolution of peace, God, that we would see your will and your way done in our nation, God. We are, we are praying that you would, you, you would draw our nation back to you. But God, we know that that can only happen as hearts one by one and, 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 and two by two and, and the multiplication of hearts coming together and coming back to you, God. We just pray that you would help us to humble ourselves, God, before we pray. And we do pray for our, our brothers and sisters all across this nation, God, for those who don't know you that would come into a relationship with you, God. We pray that we would be an answer to your prayer. Jesus, the the prayer that you prayed to your heavenly Father in John 17, that we would be one as you and your Father are one, so that the world would know that there's a Savior that loves them, that has a plan for their lives, that has called them into so much more than they could ever hope, dream, or imagine. So God, I just pray that you would make us, your church, an answer to your prayer. It's in your Son's most precious name. We pray all of this. Amen. Church, I want to invite you to stand for one final prayer today. In an attitude of prayer, if you would again, just bow your heads and close your eyes. I can't help but think today that there's someone in this room or someone listening online that your life has no peace because you don't know the person of peace. His name is Jesus Christ. And your life is is reckless. There's, there's no rest for you. And you hear a message like this and you so desperately want to live a life of peace in the midst of conflict, but you can't because there isn't a relationship with God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so we want to give you an opportunity today to respond to Jesus Christ, who the Bible declares is the Prince of Peace. And so if you're here today and you know that 
you're not in right relationship with God, that you can't experience peace because you don't know Jesus, we wanna pray a prayer with you. There's a simple way for us to do that today. It's gonna to be a prayer of confession. You're gonna repeat after me. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that you will be saved, that you will experience peace. And so if you're here today and you wanna place your hope and trust in Jesus Christ for the first time, or you wanna recommit your life to him, you wanna come back to Christ and restart your relationship with him, if that's you today, would you just raise your hand and say, but Pastor, that's me. I know I can't experience peace today without a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, yes, I see those hands. Others today, just raise it high. Yeah, yes. You can just put your hand down. We're gonna pray a prayer right now, right where you're at. And you're gonna repeat this prayer after me in church. Help me with this prayer. Say, dear Jesus, I recognize my need for you. You are the Prince of Peace. Come into my life and fill me with your spirit. I will live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, church, let's celebrate those that raise their hand praying that prayer today. It's beautiful, beautiful. Those of you that raise your hand, we're going to get a Bible to you. You can grab one on the way out or down front here. When you came in today, you received a sticker that looks just like this. I am a peacemaker. You know, when you go vote, you wear that sticker kind of proudly, right? I voted today. You took your right and your responsibility as Americans. Well, hey, as citizens of heaven, will you wear the sticker out with you today that you are a peacemaker? Carry it with you this week. Let's continue to live out this message. Have a great weekend. God bless you, church.